The PAX games have a bit of a reputation to uphold. Complex, vast gameplay options, and absolutely cutthroat. Now, PAX Premier is not the first of its kind, and I'm not just saying that because of the second edition tag. Before it, Sierra Madre Games gave us PAX Porfuriana, a game which had players take on the role of rich businessmen building industry across Mexico during the reign of dictator Porfirio Diaz. PAX's engine building, economy focus, and intrigue all began there. Pamir is thematically a different beast, of course, but it's still executed with the same focus on gameplay. This time, players take on the role of 19th century Afghan leaders attempting to forge a new state after the collapse of the Durrani Empire. Now, quick caveat, as wonderful as all these thematic ties are, they can be a bit daunting for new players like myself, not versed in those particular periods of history. And those players, such as I, will be very happy to know that it is neither crucial nor required for players to have a working understanding of this history to enjoy the game. At its most basic level, Pax Premier is a tableau building game. Players will purchase cards from the marketplace and then play them into their tableau, or their court. Players will then utilize these cards to gain actions influencing the land and its people in an effort to gain a foothold of power in the game's ever-changing political landscape. We have two boards, a centerpiece to its gameplay. The map, split into regions, can contain both player tribes and the roads and armies reflecting the power of each coalition, of which there are three. The Afghan, the British, and the Russian coalitions. The map contains two other landmarks, the score track and the political climate track. These suits represent the four different types of political climate and also determine which actions a player can take as free actions on their turn. As the game begins in a period of great political upheaval, the favoured suit marker begins with a political focus. At the beginning of the game, the market is seeded with cards from the market deck. It consists of three different types of cards, court cards, event cards, and dominance check event cards. Players themselves receive a player board which houses a few pieces of game information as well as the cylinders in that player's colour. The cylinders represent different things depending on how they are played, but they're limited to the number seen here. Players also receive a loyalty dial used to track their loyalty to a given coalition and four rupees, the currency of the game. During setup, in turn order, players will select their given loyalty and the game begins. Pax Premier is a victory points game, and while I'm not going to go over the full scoring mechanism now, I'll do this later, I do want you to be aware that players will be awarded victory points during what are called dominance checks, which are scattered throughout the game. And if ever a player is four or more points higher than all other players in the game, the game ends immediately with them being declared the winner. However, if players can keep it tight, and the leader doesn't go beyond four extra victory points, the game will end at the end of the fourth dominance check with the player with the highest number of victory points being declared the winner. The game consists of players taking a number of turns. On their turn, a player will take two actions, plus any number of free actions that are available to them. Actions available consist of purchasing a card from the marketplace, playing a card from your hand into your court, or playing a card-based action contained on one of the cards in your court. Once these actions are performed, there's a quick cleanup phase and play moves on in player order. The main actions are dead simple, but before we take a look at them, let's quickly take a look at the anatomy of our cards. The court cards. Here, there are a few main elements the player needs to be aware of. The impact icons. These are the immediate effects on playing the card into your own court the card-based actions, which can be performed when the card is activated. Sometimes cards will have an ability, a printed text that gives the owning player a special ability. And then we have the card's suit and rank. The rank alone determines the power of some of the abilities available on the card, while both the suit and rank provide other benefits. Cards in the political suit Increase the player's maximum court size, i.e. the number of cards they may have in their tableau, by one for every star. Base court size is three. So in this case, a player would have a maximum court size of three plus one. Intelligence suited cards increase a player's 
hand size. During the cleanup phase of their turn, they must discard down to two, plus the total sum of all intelligence stars in their court. Cards in the economy suit provide a tax shelter, which protects from opponents trying to steal your rupees. And finally, the military suit, which acts as a tiebreaker for endgame. Some court cards display an allegiance to one of the game's coalitions. Here, Alexander Griboyedov displays his loyalty to Russia. If a card played into a player's court differs from their current loyalty, the player must reset their loyalty dial and remove any cards or markers providing influence to their old allied coalition. Some cards display a trophy at the base of their card. This indicates that the card would be a particularly valuable prize for a matching coalition. The betrayal action that turns cards into prizes will be described a little later. For the moment though, it's nice to know that some court cards walk around with a target on their back. The second type of card that could come out in a market is the event card, each with the potential to affect the game in two different ways. The if purchased section describes an effect if the card is purchased by a player, and the discard effect which has occurred if the card is ever discarded from the market. The last card that could come out is the Dominance Check Event card, which initiates the game's scoring phases. They work very similarly to the Standard Event card, with both Bought and Discard effects. However, you'll notice that both the effects are the same. You could let it go to discard, but a player purchasing the card has far more control over when its effects take place. Timing for scoring can be absolutely crucial. During a successful dominance check, where a coalition is found to have at least four more pieces than any other coalition, each player loyal to that coalition counts their influence with them. Gifts, prizes, and patriots each contribute a single point. Players with the most influence in the dominant coalition score five, three, and one point for first, second, and third place. Then all blocks are removed from the map. If, on the other hand, the dominance check fails, meaning there is no dominant coalition, the players with the most cylinders in play score three and one points for first and second place. Now that we've introduced the cards, let's take a look at the game's core actions. To purchase a card, the player is required to spend coins, and the cost of the card is equal to the number of cards before it in its row. Let's say our player wanted to take the Tajik Warband, the cost would be two coins, as there are two cards previous to it in the row. One coin is placed on Herat, the second coin is placed on Persia, and now that the payment has been made, the Tajik Warband card is taken into the player's hand. If a player ever takes a card that has coins on it, they take the coins into their hand as well. There are a couple of things worth noting here. Firstly, a player may never take a card that they have put a coin on during the same turn. And second, if the favoured suit marker ever indicates a military political climate, the cost of cards is doubled. Instead, the player must place two rupees per card. Instead of taking a new card, the player may instead choose to play one of the cards in their hand into their court. The card must be added to one of the outermost positions of the player's court meaning it can never be slotted in anywhere. It's important to note that cards can never be moved once placed as they form a sort of movement track for players' spies, which we'll see a little bit later. It is also very important to keep in mind the region of the card being played because if that region is ruled by another player, you have to pay them a bribe for it to be added to your court, with the bribe being equal to the rank of the card being played. The ruler tokens placed on the board at the beginning of the game help keep track of which regions are ruled and by which players. In order to take a ruler token, you must have at least one tribe on the map, and then a plurality of ruling pieces, that is, more ruling pieces than any other player in the region. Both tribes and allied armies are considered ruling tokens. The ruling token is only awarded if the player has most ruling pieces. So. If there was a tie, for example, the ruling token would remain in the region. After a card enters a player's court, they then resolve its impact icons from top to bottom. These effects include placing loyal armies in the region of the card, placing roads bordering the region of the card, placing a spy on a card matching the region of the card played, placing a tribe in the region, Leveraging money from the bank, noting that this money has to be repaid if the card is ever removed from the court. And then there are symbols that can alter the current political climate. 
Now, this climate, as I said earlier, affects the games in a very powerful way. You see, the final way a player can spend their two actions is by utilizing card-based actions sitting on the cards in their court. Each card may only be activated once per turn, with only one card-based action selected per card. Now, these actions usually count towards the player's two actions per turn, but if the selected card suit matches the suit reflected by the current political climate, the card's action may instead be taken for free, not counting towards the two action limit. For these, we have six different actions performed exactly the same regardless of how they are activated. The build action where players may place armies and roads in regions that they control. The tax action allows players to take rupees from either the marketplace or from other players' bank accounts so long as they have a matching region card in their court. Remembering economy suited cards in that player's court may prevent the taxation action. The gift action allows the player to purchase a gift for their loyal coalition. Here the player spends two, four or six rupees covering the indicated spot with one of their cylinders. Purchased gifts provide one point of influence. The movement action allows players to move armies on the map or spies on court cards as many times as they want up to the rank of the card. Moving an army requires a loyal road, whereas spies are simply moved to their adjacent card. It is worth noting here that spies move along cards in the player's courts clockwise or anti-clockwise as if they formed a single continuous track around the area of play. Battles too may take place on the map, with the player being able to remove a number of tokens up to the rank of the card. Here, loyal armies can go up against either other coalitions or other players' tribes so long as they are not allied to the same army. Armies and roads are simply removed from the map and returned to the supply, while tribes are removed to the player's player board. It is worth noting though, that even though the card dictates the power of the battle action, you're only ever able to remove a number of tokens equal to the number of loyal armies you have in the region. Spies may also battle, with players removing opposing spies from any player's court where they have their own. Finally, the Betray action allows players to utilize their spies, removing a court card where one is located. Here our blue player has Haji Mirza Agassi. For an action, the red player may discard two rupees to activate their Betray action targeting the card. The card itself is discarded, and all spies present on the card are removed to their player's supply. After the card is discarded, the player may choose to take that card into their own supply as a prize, tucking it behind their loyalty dial. Each prize also counts as an influence. Should a player decide to take a prize where the market does not match their current loyal coalition, the player must immediately reset their standing with the new coalition. After the player has taken their main actions and any free actions allowed to them, we have a cleanup phase. First, the player discards down to their maximum court size, then down to their maximum hand size. They resolve any events present in the most left hand column, and then the market is filled. All cards slide down to their left most available location, and new cards are drawn to fill the gaps. Pax Premier is a really tough game for me to review here. I recognise the great design, I recognise just what it is that people like about this so much, and don't get me wrong, I am certainly one of them, but I can't shine a light on anything and say, this is the element that makes Pax Premier great. Because looking at all the actions, looking at all the bits and pieces that make up this game, you wouldn't think you've got anything special here, right? It's a tableau builder. It's got some area control elements. It's got some very nice player interaction with the spies, the betrayal, and the whole ownership of a region thing. There's a lot of cool stuff in there that is almost a dime a dozen in the games I've got sitting around me here. But you put these things together and you disperse all the powers just so, and you get a beautifully infuriating game that will never play the way you want it to play. It will never play the way that you expect to play. 
And maybe it's the replayability, maybe it's the level of uncertainty that comes with opening up the box and setting this thing up on the table that makes it so damn good. But is that enough to make it a great game? Because it certainly is, but I cannot tell you why. <laughs> I've already addressed the component situation as a part of the unboxing. This is by far the most beautiful game I have seen all year. Component quality, everything about it just hits the right box, right? Setting up the game is a breeze. This has got to be one of the quickest box to set up times that I've seen for this sort of mid to heavyweight scene. And then gameplay itself is not too long either. Turns are lightning fast, you play your two actions and as many free actions as you can get out there, but then it's up to the next guy and even then, when it's not your turn, you are watching like a hawk to see what goes on because chances are you've won the game in the next round if that player doesn't do the thing that they're just about to do. And so it's fascinating watching this game unfold. But why? And I don't think it's because I'm invested in the theme. I know very little about the theme here. And while I appreciate the fact that all of these cards, they, they mean something to someone and they would provide such a wonderful immersion for those people. But here I'm just kind of fascinated by the puzzle and the, the gameplay behind it. I really, I really don't know how to present this one to you guys. It's certainly not a complex game. All the mechanics by themselves are really easy to digest, but it's the way that these things weave together, the intricacies of the game, that really turn it into this monster that it is, right? I don't know. Pax Premier has this devious, simple nature that kind of tricks you into thinking you know what you're doing when you're playing it, which I find really endearing, and it's brought me back to the game more often than not. I'm absolutely loving the solo play here, just as a quick aside. I know I didn't talk about it uh, in the overview of the game just before, but I just gotta say it is a very well-implemented AI, it certainly does help um, get a grip on the game as a solo play. But I I also really think it serves a purpose fleshing out the two-player game, giving it that three-player feel. Of course, it doesn't turn it into a co-op game at all. It is still a heavy competitive game, but I think it sort of helps fill up the map. I guess all I can say here is that after, what, six or seven plays, I am still so excited to see what else this game can throw at me. And I think that as I and the players that I play with grow with the game and become more familiar with its ins and outs, we're gonna find a very rewarding experience inside the box. But right now, I guess I'm still new to it. I mean, some of you guys out there have experienced Pax Pamir at the first edition mark and have been able to watch it grow and be presented to you in this beautiful second edition box. And I wonder if you guys are feeling as enthused about it as I. I'd really be interested in hearing your thoughts on this one. Uh, if you've got a spare couple of minutes, just chuck a, a mini review or whatever you want to do of your version of PAX down in the comments down here, because I think it's a game that we're all playing, but we never actually end up playing the same game at the table. I don't know. Anyway, that's about enough of me prattling on about this game. It's now up to you guys to get out there and get a couple of games under your belt. Make sure you come on back and tell me what you think about it. If you do, I'm actually really interested to see how this one is received out there in the community. But besides that, guys and gals, we are done. So if you've enjoyed the vid, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow. But besides that, I'm out of here. It's time to go to bed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Michael. This is Bits of Board. We'll catch you next time.